All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our visitor, Ken Laprat, who's in Texas, and he'll be speaking to us on the topic of dispensationalism, specifically what's known as ultra dispensationalism. How are you, Ken? Doing great. Thank you, Carlos. You're the go-to guy, as they say, on this topic, which I'm not very familiar with. So give a brief sketch, if you will, outline uh, to the audience on, first of all, how would you define dispensationalism? It's sort of a rigid system that's, that's developed since the 19th century, dividing Bible material into specific time frames. It started with the advent of belief in a pre-tribulation rapture. Oh, about 1830, a young lady, still a teenager, named Margaret MacDonald, had visions, uh, supposedly, about a secret rapture, a secret gathering of Christians before the time of Great Tribulation. And uh, so it got popularized with Edward Irving. Within a short time frame, it became popularized with the Plymouth Brethren, John Nelson Darby. And um, it became a, a movement. It later uh, became popularized in America with the Schofield Bible, with notes about different dispensational time frames. And this has been done differently with different groups over the years. Uh, it has uh, developed into a more sophisticated theology with, with certain people nowadays that I really don't know, know that much about. Uh, the type of dispensationalism that I was introduced to was sort of the fundamental dispensationalism that started in the 1830s. It filtered through E.W. Bullinger, who uh, made the Companion Bible, uh, which was popular in my old background, uh, along with the works of, of Bullinger, in which um, in order to distinguish the gospel of the gospels, Jesus's message, from a convoluted idea of grace, Jesus was actually separated from the gospel pertinent to the church of God as of the day of Pentecost until the rapture would, would have been the uh, thinking pattern uh, consistent with the 19th century th theologians and up through some 20th century religion and into the 21st century. You know, the it, it, things could be ultra dispensationalist in a couple of ways. Normally means to focus on Paul's latter letters put the focus on, say, Ephesians, not latter necessarily in when they were written, but latter in terms of where they're placed in the New Testament, and say that Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians contain the core unit of information for the church. Less ultra interpretation would be all of the Pauline letters. That was the, the package that I was indoctrinated in that from Romans to 2 Thessalonians, as they are set out in modern New Testaments, that that is the core instruction for Christians. Anything before that was basically to Jews before the day of Pentecost, such as Jesus's teachings in the Gospels. They were not considered New Covenant teachings. Uh, the book of Acts was sometime in my background considered a book of transition, where people were moving out and away from uh, the older things taught by Jesus and John the Baptist. This dispensational th thing would work in Bullinger, where maybe at the end of Acts, that would say that, okay, now, now finally, the Jews who responded negatively to Paul in Acts 28, they've turned away. So that's the beginning of the new dispensation, which focuses on the information and from Ephesians to Second Thessalonians. Uh, there are some, you know, followers of E.W. Bullinger who would emphasize it that way. Uh, other people would not be quite as ultra dispensationalist like uh, those who simply reject the Gospels, which is bad enough. But uh, th this type of thing uh, supposes, supposedly explains why uh, 
certain letters talk about grace. You know, people can isolate verses, think that, well, I've, I've got a done deal salvation going on by simply following certain verses extracted from their context as a formula. And um, instead of obeying Jesus, which involves paying close attention, going through the narrow gate, not going through uh, the broad way, paying attention to the influence of false prophets, uh, paying attention to the fruit production of good trees and how they contrast with the fruit production of bad trees with a stark warning that in Matthew 7, in that context, that uh, in that day, many will come up saying, Lord, Lord, to Jesus, and even give spiritual evidence for their enthusiasm, saying, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we perform many miracles? And they will be rejected for not being obedient doers, practicers of the words of Jesus, as you see in the parable of the the man who built his found foundation on, uh, you know, built his house on a real foundation on the rock, whereas the one who built his house on the sand heard Jesus's words but did not practice them as vital to salvation. And so, um, you know, these type of warnings are disregarded by think that oh that that was for uh, a warning for a previous time period. Thank you, Ken. Well, the way I was introduced into this whole dispensationalist talk in my early Christian days, I converted in my early 30s, as some of our viewers know, so I wasn't brought up in church, was through a book called One God and One Lord, which is published by a group called Spirit and Truth Fellowship. And they say this on a couple of their pages. I mean, the main thrust of the book is really about uh, teaching that there is one God, the Father, that Jesus is not God, and they're excellent on that. And that's why, really, I got this book, or they actually sent me this book, which I'm very thankful for, and it helped me a lot in my journey. But amongst the pages, they have things like this on page 99. We use the term Hebrew Scriptures here because, technically, the four Gospels are part of what is called the Old Testament. And then, in other pages, 135, 36, perhaps one of the most confusing of these additions has been the page in the Bible between Malachi and Matthew that says the New Testament. This error has many significant and harmful ramifications. Now, I don't know if you've read this book. You have this book? I, I do have this book. I've read uh, parts of it. I've noticed the good work done on monotheistic thinking. I've also noticed the quote like this quote, and this quote in itself, I think, has many significant and harmful ramifications. Well, first of all, I wanted to ask you, what type of dispensationalism is this? Is this that classical one or is this that ultra one? That's the first question. And the second one mm -hmm. is, is that one about what do you think they mean by the significant and harmful ramifications of not accepting this type of view? Well, this particular quote reflects my old background. One of the three uh, authors of the book was a student with me, a friend of mine in uh, the Seventh Way Corps in the 1970s. The other two authors were in previous Way Corps groups. So we were all in under the instruction of the Way International. And this reflects exactly the teaching of uh, a man ca who called himself Dr. Victor Paul Weirwell, uh, the original president and founder of the Way International. This idea comes directly from his whole class called Power for Abundant Living, which was filmed in 1968. Uh, it went out on, on tapes and on films throughout the 70s and into the 80s, and at least until the mid 80s. Uh, and was a basic indoctrination in what you would call classical uh, dispensationalism. The Gospels are Old Testament, but after the Gospels, you can consider from Acts onward the New Testament. But there were, there were kind of, uh, oh, fishy things attached to certain books in the New Testament. Sometimes I think dispensationalism itself, it's kind of an offshoot of Luther's attitude upon translating the New Testament to relegate certain books as 
inferior to other books, to call the epistle of James an epistle of straw. Why? Because James emphasized that faith without works is dead. Faith without corresponding good works is dead. Uh, Luther wrongly saw that as a contradiction to Paul's thesis uh, in the book of Romans and Galatians, where he contrasts the life of faith or faithfulness to the Messiah with works in a context of talking about old covenant observances, uh, like the circumcision and, uh, and, and other things. So, so part of that type of thinking of distinguishing between the value of certain New Testament books and others is, is part of dispensationalism, you know, as far as I can tell, as, it, as it's filtered down through the ages. You know, these people think that if you emphasize obedience and doing stuff, that you're wrongly placing confidence in your own ability to earn your salvation by works. That's the kind of vocabulary by which they would see that, uh, you know, doing stuff as if it relates to salvation is somehow a perverse uh, effort to earn your salvation by works. And they would call that dangerous. That's why some of them who misunderstand the word baptism, which I'm sure we'll get to later, but they would say, hey, if you get baptized and you depend on that as having anything to do with your salvation, then, aha, you are trying to earn your salvation by works. And you don't realize that it's all by grace. Right. Faith and grace are used terminology for getting away with making no real effort to change your life in light of Jesus' teachings. Right. Thank you, Ken. So, yes, I was not alerted to this. I actually was alerted to this uh, other teachings from this group by a cousin of mine at the time who said, uh, did you know that that group does not teach uh, baptism? And I said, what do you mean? But, oh, like you don't have to get baptized. You, you can get baptized if you want to, but it's not essential. It's not, you know, something Jesus told you to do. Now, we don't mean to come across as bashing anyone, as we say, right? We're, yeah. we're not trying to do it. What I'm trying to do is expose people to the fact that even though you might agree with one thing with, with certain groups, even our Restoration Fellowship, which I represent, please study every other stuff, right? So, so let's not just agree on the one thing, because as I say, Christianity is not a single issue. There are many components to salvation. Jesus' brother even said, James, even demons believe God is one person and they tremble. If it were that easy, but there are many other components. Through the years, I have been studying and reading other things. Some years ago now, this same group that published that One God, One Lord book published Bible translation and commentary of their own called the Revised English Version. So I wanted to show you a couple of quotes here so you can find this online. And again, mm -hmm. this is meant for you to be convinced in, in your own mind, weigh it up like I did, like Kent has done and come to your own understanding. We believe this to be wrong now, and we have our reasons, and, and Ken, you can talk about those. The responsible thing to do to also highlight these, these differences, I believe. So take, for example, this commentary on Romans 3.22, mm -hmm. where Paul says, the righteousness of God that comes through trust in Jesus Christ to all those who believe, for there is no distinction between Jews and Greeks. And this is the REV translation. But that, now that's a fine translation to me. But then they have this massive commentary, as you can see there. You go down and then it says in part, and I just want to highlight this part. What Jesus said and did was intimately connected with the Old Testament. And he used the language and concepts of the Old Testament when he taught. This would be much easier to see if the page in the Bible that is traditionally placed between Malachi and Matthew and says in huge letters, the New Testament was placed between the Gospel of John and the book of Acts. It's an echo of the, of the same thing they said in, in their previous work, the One God, One Lord book. My question is, so really the teachings and words of Jesus are not for the church. Just to give an imaginary implication, there would be at least one generation, maybe two generations of Christians without a gospel at all. 
Uh, the reason I say this is that if Jesus's teachings were just a summing up of what was pertinent to Jews before the day of Pentecost, and then he said, go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, you know, teaching them to do, to practice what I have taught you. This would mean that that instruction was not relevant to Christians after the day of Pentecost. So it had a very short-lived duration. So it, it would mean this. It would mean that, well, even though Matthew might have been written in the 60s, 70s, or 80s, along with Luke, Mark, maybe in the 50s or 60s, John, maybe as late as the 90s, that all these things, even though they were written within Christian communities, teach people what had been transmitted orally until that time. Jesus had preached the gospel of the kingdom. Then in the book of Acts, they're running around preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then you have Paul's writings where the vocabulary is a little different in explaining how an international family of Jew and Gentile is being uh, transformed and, uh, you know, out of a revamped Israel, so to speak, with the new covenant idea of Gentiles being grafted in to the roots of Israelite faith. And uh, to say that, you know, it all starts with Paul's teaching, uh, you know, which doesn't come together into a collection of writings until decades later, is to say that, well, these early Christians, they were running around with no gospel at all or a misguided gospel when they were transmitting the teachings of Jesus, which later got written down by reliable eyewitnesses. Uh, most of the, the Gospels, I believe, were historically speaking, written after uh, Paul's epistles were written. So why would they write them all these decades later without a strong warning? Please do not apply this. These are dangerous to apply. Uh, and these come from bona fide Christian communities, uh, like in Antioch of Syria, maybe, or other places around the Mediterranean world, which, you know, develop uh, the themes of Jesus's teachings as relevant and never, uh, you know, within John and John 12, uh, toward the end of the chapter, where, you know, in that coming day, I'm not going to be the one judging you because I didn't come to condemn the world or to judge the world, but my words will be the judging factor, my very words, which is congruent with what was prophesied by Moses in Deuteronomy 18. The new covenant realities were prophesied in some amount of detail in Old Testament scriptures, and including the, the focus on the coming kingdom of God. That would make the Baptist, who to many Christians, this is not just my personal interpretation or, you, or yours, Mm -hmm. He really is the person that introduced this new covenant. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you read Mark 1, it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet. And then he introduces uh, a couple of quotes. It's a sort of mishmash of, I believe it's Malachi, a couple of uh, verses in Deuteronomy and Exodus, I believe. But it has to do about this messenger and who that messenger is preparing the way for representational sense is the Lord God through his son, Jesus, his human son. It's the famous image of John came baptiz baptizing, right? These images we've seen in movies since the, uh, you know, 40s and 50s, I guess. Right. Of this guy in the sheep clothes, you know, with long wild hair. He's a wild man. He came from the desert. And this guy now says to his people, he's got a message for Israel, right? He's in at the outskirts, Judean countryside, as it says there in verse 5. And he right. says, baptize for the remission of sins. In other words, if you want God to forgive you of your sins, do this. And then he starts immersing them in water. My thinking about that episode there is, as a Jew, if I'm looking at that as a Jew, Back then, you think to yourself, what happens to the temple? Now, the whole Levitical system of this is how God said you were supposed to redeem 
your sins or atone for your sins. So really, John the Baptist introduces in a real physical way that new covenant spoken about from the, as you said, the Old Testament prophets, namely Jeremiah, right? This system, this ultra-dispensationalist system now makes them really obsolete to this, what we call the New Covenant Christian Church then. You're spot on. That That is the introduction of the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, is the preliminary role of, of John the Baptist and washing, which was not this thing of individuals getting dunked or immersed in water. It was not part of any ceremonial washing practice of Old Testament times. There was washing of the priests and the utensils in uh, the times of the tabernacle and later the, the temple in, uh, in you know, Old Testament Jewish history. But what John was doing was unique. It had to do with individuals owning up to their responsibility before God, confessing their sins, repenting, which means to change, to change your life direction, to change your mindset and move in a new new direction. And, uh, you know, and then Jesus followed up on it. You know, he uh, baptized in the sense of supervising baptisms at the end of John 3 and in John 4, although he didn't personally carry them out. But at one time, his baptisms were more than the baptisms of John the ba Baptist. But his baptism had the different factor that Messiah is here. Then, you know, shortly after his death and resurrection, seal and ratify the new covenant uh, in a special way, when uh, Peter speaks to the crowds in Acts chapter 2, he gives the same sort of admonition, repent and be baptized, and you will receive the gift of Holy Spirit. Their receiving Holy Spirit is not called baptism. When you know when you talk about baptism in Holy Spirit, that that idea of it replacing the baptism of a former dispensation is just a bad misunderstanding of of the Greek words used for baptize and baptism, as well as a theology that was imposed by the founder of my old organization, uh, Victor Paul Weirwall, who taught this idea in his foundational class of power for abundant living it was part of his dispensational package maybe sort of unique to the way uh, i don't know how many other dispensationalists have downplayed water baptism so if we go back to the rev again highlight these things and again people have to be convinced in their own minds about these issues obviously under that system you have outlined ken then Baptism is a problem, quote unquote, right? We have this commentary on Acts 1 5 because John baptized with water, but you will be baptized in Holy Spirit not many days from now. So this becomes now a very important verse for this system, right? Right. And then it says in part here, it says there is one baptism for the Christian, and it is spirit, not water. And then it says John's baptism was a shadow of what was to come. And even John himself said this in Matthew 3.11, there is no reason to baptize in water today. Nevertheless, practice continues, and sadly, some even teach that it is necessary for salvation. And then they quote John Shanehite, the history and doctrine of Christian baptism. Shanehite is, is the head of this organization as, at the moment, as I understand it. But interestingly, this was changed some time ago in the last few years or so because they used to refer you to a book by John Lynn, who was part of this group, called What is True Baptism? I don't know if you're familiar with that book specifically. I know you've heard of John Lynn. Right. And I did read part of, I haven't read uh, Shanghai's uh, book. I did read part of John Lynn's book online at one point. I forget exactly where I accessed it, but I saw that it was the same old, same old in which I had been indoctrinated. It's not right to say that the church now is only baptizing Holy Spirit, which, by the way, I don't yeah. even know what that would look like. I don't know how I would baptize someone in the Holy Spirit. 
And right. then this, this line is crucial. There is no reason to baptize in water today because it's not necessary for salvation. One thing that comes to mind is the fact that these people have misunderstood the word baptism itself. For example, uh, you know, the noun baptism, there are Greek words are baptisma and baptismos. The verb baptize, it's ba from baptizo, from a root baptain. Excuse me if my pronunciation of the Greek words isn't quite right. These words mean to plunge, immerse, or wash. Uh, baptizo is also derived from uh, an earlier verb, bapto, which means to dip. These are all words for washing, bathing. You know, perhaps the, if a translation would use terms like that, it would be clearer uh, to more people. But its literal meaning is always to dip into water or some sort of liquid. There's a Greek poet, a medical man named Nicander, who about 200 BC talked, uh, wrote about making pickles. And he used the word bapto for dipping the cucumbers into boiling water, and then said that, um, you know, you, it furthermore needed to be baptized, baptizo, into a vinegar solution. So it's kind of like, you know, nowadays, when you talk about um, pickling cucumbers or some other vegetable or fruit, to pickle something, you don't have to say, well, in water or in brine or in vinegar or whatever liquid, it's implied in the word. And baptize just does have that literal understanding. It means to dip into water. Now, it can be used figuratively, just like other words can be used figuratively. I could use the word pickle that, boy, I'm, I'm really in a pickle right now, meaning that I'm in a tight bind. I'm immersed in a, a situation. But uh, in the New Testament does that. But they fail to understand that there's no contrast uh, like you know the acts 1 5 verse for john certainly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized in holy spirit not many days hence it doesn't say instead of water it doesn't imply that a one baptism has been outdated and replaced by another all of that is interpretive it's the interpretation of Victor Paul Weirwell is carried along by some of these other gentlemen and me for over 40 years. I really thought I had that, that error uh, just carved into my, my brain in a certain way. Uh, the word but, for example, it's not the strong Greek word for contrast. It's not Allah, A-L-L-A. Uh, it is de, which is, um, you know, just means D-E. It's just a connective word. It's a weak connective. It could be translated and. John baptized with water, and you shall be baptized with Holy Spirit not many days since. To make that the basis of a strong contrast of dispensational is to make the scriptures agree with your preconceived ideas. And then when you read Acts chapter 2 and the pouring out, of it's called pouring out, another term involving liquid pouring out of Holy Spirit is from the ascended Jesus, uh, empowering the people on that particular occasion to speak with languages, all these Gentile languages, to speak the wonderful works of God. All of that was evidence that Jesus had done something marvelous that corresponded with uh, the you know prophetic promises of God culminating in the Messiah. But never is Holy Spirit uh, linked to baptism in a way to uh, disavow the, the baptism with water that moved from John's baptism to baptism in the Messiah. Because Peter right away in Acts 2 says, okay, repent, same as what John and Jesus had said during the Gospels, and be baptized, obviously talking about water, being dipped, being plunged. And you shall receive the gift of Holy Spirit as a result of the obedience of repentance coupled with getting dunked in water. It's, it's clear language. Baptism in the Messiah and the Lord Jesus is baptism in water. Mm -hmm. He baptized in Holy Spirit, never used in a noun form, but baptized in Holy Spirit is only used six 
in six occasions to make a specific point about the greatness of uh, what the Messiah would be and accomplish. You know, it's not a replacement theology for, oh, out with the old uh, inferior water, in with new Holy Spirit, and everyone who speaks gibberish assumes that they have proof that they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's not the, the idea of the New Testament. Indicative of error of, of this type of teaching is the fact that, as far as I know, this type of understanding was not known before, what, the, was it introduced only maybe in the last hundred years or so? There been, there's been confusion about baptism with, of course, the infant uh, baptisms. And sure, things. but it always involved water. Right, it always involved water. No, no group, as far as I know, a self-professed Christian group came out and said, oh, no, no water at all. It's just spirit. I mean, I, I, that's unknown to me in the history of Christianity. Yeah, it's kind of a unique fluke, as far as I can tell. There have been previous groups who moved away from symbolism altogether. I like, I think Quakers didn't baptize uh, back in the day or celebrate communion. But I think this, this idea of replacing physical water baptism with spiritual Holy Spirit baptism is, I think it's unique to my old group. I'll say one other thing that that quote from Ephesians 4, 5, 4 5, which says one baptism, and to say, oh, that's spirit instead of water. The previous verse gives, it's, uh, it's a list of, you know, seven points of unity. So it already says one spirit. One spirit is already in the context. One, one baptism. Right. So in verse four, there, one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I, I think we're seeing what I'm going through here with you briefly, and people, again, I hope you do your research. Do not believe any, anything my friend Ken has to say. <laughs> Don't believe me, by the way. Just yeah. do your own homework regarding these things, because this, I think, again, that Christianity is not a single-issue thing. You know, if Christ were to just come back for the one God people, think about it. Muslims, right? Right. Uh, uh, Jews who do not accept Jesus as their Messiah, all good to go. I mean, I don't think that's how it works. Right. But again, we could be wrong. So please do your own homework. Let me take you to another result of this so-called ultra-dispensationalist view, which is the letters of Paul, the primacy, as I call it, of the letters of Paul. And I found this comment in regards to Matthew 24, 40, where Jesus said two will be in the field, one is taken, one is left. It says in part here, which is another long commentary. So it says in part that the revelation that is addressed specifically to the Christian church is written in the seven epistles. Now remember the context here, Matthew 24, Jesus telling the apostles, or answering, I should say, the apostles, you know, what is the sign of your coming? It also says in part that the fact that this, that the seven epistles of Paul, and they say Romans through Thessalonians, are especially important to the Christian church, so that the seven are it, basically, is not often taught, yet it is of vital importance, they say. Which seven letters they're talking about? Because as far as I know, there are at least 13, if you take, I, I believe, the book of Hebrews, 14 letters right. of Paul. And what about the other letters of Paul? What they're doing here is they're counting First and Second Corinthians as one and First and Second Thessalonians as one. So they're going Romans, uh, first and second Corinthians as one, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first and second Thessalonians. That's what they're calling the seven, even though there are nine. The other ones, they, uh, you know, talk about the pastoral letters being personal correspondence and things like that. Hebrews, they kind of leave Hebrews, James, first and second Peter uh, as dispensationally vague. Like uh, James uh, writes this letter to the 12 tribes. And so it is dispensational to say, oh, this isn't exactly to Christians. It's just to Jewish Christians who were still practicing, observing the law of Moses, uh, while at the same time believing in the Messiah. 
So they would say that, you know, they didn't call it an epistle of straw, but they would say that it, it doesn't apply directly to modern Christians. They found some reasons to disregard Hebrews that way too. Even though the book of Hebrews, the title is far after the, the thing was written. It's not uh, actually called in the old manuscripts, the epistle to the Hebrews, as if it's specifically to Jewish Christians. But um, it, it's, it's just a, a misunderstanding in order to isolate Pauline theology and a certain dispensational way to make it seem like it's disconnected from Jesus's teachings and other writings of the New Testament. Use all those writings, use the ones from Romans to Second Thessalonians as more authoritative. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you can once again go through those Romans, yep. then then count first and second Corinthians as the second one, mm -hmm. Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, one and two, counting as one. Right, because all morning I was, you know, uh, I flunked math. So I thought, oh, I'll just, you know, lay it at the feet of my bad math. But, okay, so now I get it. So they count the, the what we would call 1 Corinthians, second as one letter. And another thing I just learned going through the REV commentary Again, you can see this online. The fact that, well, let me read some of the comments on this verse in Revelation 1.4. He's addressing the seven churches or congregations. But as you can see there, it says, because John penned the book of Revelation and sent it to those seven churches, many commentators have falsely assumed that the letters to those same churches in the book of Revelation, which are in chapters 2 and three are written to Christians. They are not. I just found this out. So the book of Revelation is not for us either. In the dispensational theology, it's for the people who are going to be around after the Christians have been raptured from the earth, according to that. And they will highlight the usage of Jews and Gentiles then throughout the book of Revelation to see See, God is dealing with Jews and Gentiles as separate entities once again. He's not talking to the church, the body of Christ, in which ethnic di distinctions have been abolished. Once again, it's a terrible type of eisegesis not allowing the text to speak for itself. One of the book of Revelation talks about to all who've been redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have, have we been redeemed uh, as Christians, whether we're from a Jewish or Gentile background? Sure we have. And it, it has to do with things that were going on back then in the, at the end of the first century, things that will happen in the future. And Jesus' chronology in Matthew 24 about when things will happen, like the gathering of his people after those days of tribulation. As, as far as I can tell, and that's why... I also wanted to have you on to correct any misunderstandings or misillusions I may have. The reason now why the book of Revelation is not for us either is also because of this belief that the church, Christians, will mm -hmm. be raptured, taken into heaven. Really, the whole of what we call the Great Tribulation and the what's known as the wrath of God, it, they sort of, as far as I can see, they sort of collapse the great tribulation with the wrath of God. I was looking at another long commentary on this verse in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. It says in part, though, the post-tribulation premillennial rapture doctrine. Yeah, that's what I believe now. Yeah, yeah. we're, we're post-trip. It, it, it goes on to say that, so because some Christians believe that, that Christians go through the entire tribulation, mm -hmm. and then just as Jesus and his army are coming down from heaven to fight the battle of Armageddon, only until then are Christians, quote, raptured to meet uh, Jesus in the air and then come back down to earth and battle with him, really, right? So we can establish the kingdom of God with Christ. But then it says, however, that doctrine cannot be correct for a number of reasons. And I just want to highlight their first reason. Right. Christians would then go through the wrath, whereas the Bible says Christians do not go through the wrath. Now, that's true. What's known as the wrath of God, we will be protected. Actually, 
the book of Revelation talks about a seal, a seal that God will seal his people and they will be protected. But we will still be on earth. That's why we require that seal. I believe it's in Revelation chapter 7 and 9. Is that correct? Do I have it right? Yeah, it's it, once again, it's sloppy eisegesis, not exegesis of, of the text. Nowhere is the great tribulation for which the scriptures prepare believers to endure any christian believers who are alive at that time nothing equates that with god's pouring out of wrath which is a you know a metaphor for his righteous judgment that in revelation 15 and 16 is poured you see the bowls of wrath in chapter 16 poured out on the kingdom of the beast and on those who continue to blaspheme and will not change will not repent, will not humble themselves to God. And you see the idea that this is going to happen to the kingdom of the beast, the, the empires uh, directly controlled by him, and people throughout the world who give allegiance to, to the beast, who uh, receive the, the mark on the forehead and all that. But uh, to me, it, it seems the type of plagues seem so parallel to uh, the plagues poured out on Egypt in the book of Exodus. And for at least the last seven of those 10 plagues, what happens is these things are poured out on the Egyptians. But even though the Israelites are in Egypt, in the land of Goshen, they are spared from the effects of those plagues. Uh, they're, they are protected in a way. And it seems to be, uh, you know, very parallel to that, that Okay, God's judgments come upon uh, this kingdom power of the unrepentant, of the defiant uh, followers of the beast. Whereas, you know, believers will still be present until Christ really comes back, will uh, be protected from that. And you can see in the middle of chapter 16 of Revelation that it's still, that is going on until he comes. Uh, I forget exactly which verse it is, but it's before Jesus's arrival. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's just so corresponds to the whole New Testament. People who exalt the, the uh, church epistles like Second Thessalonians seem to be totally negligent of the fact that Paul warns them of the same thing, that that day uh, will not arrive until the man of sin be revealed uh, and, and there be a rebellion. Uh, you know, that, that is totally ignored or explained away in this pre-dispensational um, pre or pre-tribulation wrath scenario, pre-tribulation rapture, I'm sorry. Uh, these things are explained away, and, uh, but the same warning about the man of sin being revealed and, and Jesus' warning about the abomination of desolation that you can read about in Daniel. Uh, all of these things are so congruent to the, the picture of when the, the bowls of wrath are poured out. It's all before that. But there is a protection. And the Great Tribulation is not the same thing as the pouring out of, of wrath, which means God's righteous judgment on the rebellious. Right. So a good question to ask, for example, and these are the verses in Revelation 7, 3. Uh, I think one of the angels says, do not harm the earth the sea trees until we seal the slaves of our God on their foreheads. And then again, Revelation 9, 4, it mm -hmm. says, they, the locusts in context, were told not to harm the grass of the earth, any green plant, tree, but only people who do not have God's seal on their foreheads. Right. So you have to ask yourself a question if you're a so-called pre-tree rapture person. Why would Revelation say this if the church is no longer in harm's way on the earth, right? Obviously, we're still here, and God will protect us from his coming wrath. So, Ken, thank you so much for your time. A any uh, advice out there in, in regards to what we've discussed? Any last words? Even if uh, the translation might be good about certain points, I do not recommend reading the commentary with the REV. And I don't say that because I'm bashing people or I endorse some sort of censorship. But unless you want to explore the details of 
occultic mindset, occultic way of thinking, of which I was uh, a part. And I recognize that for uh, for years now, that I was deeply immersed in that type of uh, thinking. But unless you want to check that out, I don't, there's so many wonderful edifying things to, to read, to study. The second edition of Anthony Buzzard's translation is out. The One God, the Father, One Man, Messiah translation. I uh, reread the, the introduction of that last night and was so blessed and edified to be reminded of the kingdom of God gospel and the unity of that gospel from the gospels throughout the book of Acts. Paul, who wrote his epistles, was a preacher of the kingdom all the way till the very closing verses of the book of Acts, as well as Philip, uh, as well as Peter and all the other people involved in the book of Acts. And these things are, are clear and obvious by allowing the scriptures to speak for themselves. There are lots of other translations that are, are wonderful resources with top-notch scholarship. I'm reading an Old Testament called The First Testament by John Goldinge, which very insightful, very uh, up-to-date in certain details of translation. Another one, The Hebrew uh, Scriptures by Robert Alter, with uh, lots of commentary, lots of footnotes on uh, Hebrew word usage, uh, possible differences in, in textual uh, information from and, and things like that. But there's so much, uh, as well as the uh, other New Testaments that emphasize Christian monotheism. To emphasize non-Trinitarianism, but at the same time separate Jesus from his words, to me is just a, a, a terrible example of saying that, well, you believe God is one? That's okay, but the demons do that <laughs> also. Uh, but there's so much, uh, you know, that can be studied that is, it's not that is not confusing. That's not trying to impose a preconceived system onto the Bible records. And that dispensational system uh, imposed on this commentary we've looked at, it's the same indoctrination I received uh, years ago, and I had to escape from it because I became exposed to rotten fruit, so to say. I saw where that type of thinking led. Once people were latched onto the idea that hey, we're saved no matter what we do, that's what grace means. Uh, we, we graced out. We would, we would say that as an expression. Hey, I really graced out on that, meaning I got away with not suffering the consequences for some sort of sinful behavior. That whole way of thinking led to such devils, devilishly destructive fruit. And I saw it in my own life as well in the life of others. I have no right to accuse or point fingers at others. But once I got to be exposed to the gospel of the kingdom, especially through uh, one of Anthony Buzzard's books called Our Fathers Who Aren't in Heaven, uh, back almost 20 years ago, then things started to click. Things sort of started to come into place where I could read the gospels as instructions to me, along with the book of Revelation, along with Hebrews and James, and see how it all fits without contradictions. Paul, the, uh, even using different vocabulary and explaining different issues among the configurations of Jews and Gentiles does not contradict Jesus's kingdom gospel uh, in, in any detail. And, and you see that once you don't have this uh, bogus paradigm stuck in your brain where you, you just can't see it. Again, I must repeat myself, do not believe a single word we have said in this video if you happen to watch it. Yeah. As Paul told Timothy, and we know that scripture well study to show yourself approved by God. Only God will be our judge, challenges you to be a worker, a hard worker, who uses the sound doctrine of our Lord Jesus, as Paul calls it, in a right and proper way not to misuse it. And yes, I, I, I strongly believe this system that I, again, I was not born in a church. I didn't even grow up in a church. But when I was first exposed to it, Ken, it shocked me because he told me that then who is Jesus to me? What are his words? Well, 
his teachings don't belong to me. They belong to his people then. I mean, it was a shocking thing to me. So please study these things out. Uh, if you'd like to know more about uh, Ken Laprat and his incredible journey and his incredible missionary work right now and, and uh, work there in Texas and in Mexico. He speaks habla español, he speaks Spanish. Uh, so he, you do great work and, and keep it up, brother. And if you want to know more about him, check out the testimony we have on our youtube.com restoration fellowship. Subscribe to the YouTube. I often put out uh, little studies like this. Thank you, Ken, once again. God bless you. I'll see you down the road, brother. Thank you.